Hello there, everyone. Zan Talk here with Selectstar Gaming, and welcome to another episode here of Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. Uh, continuing on from the stream archive footage that I played a while back, but let's go ahead and kick it off to past me, who's going to be continuing through the game. Take it away. Then he stopped. Seven sat on the picture and looked at the red light near his feet. His eyes narrowed. Then suddenly, his eyes went wide and he shot up straight. Shit. What? What's wrong? Holy shit, this is nuts. Um, what's nuts? I remember. Remember what? Everything. Everything? Get there! Yeah, yeah, I, I remember all of it. My memory's back. I Fucking what finally. I got snatched. Seven's voice was filled with excitement. What? Shock and excitement had frozen June Pain Place, along with Snake and Clover. Let me tell you what happened. Seven hastily drew a shaking hand across his mouth and began to speak. Like Snake said, Ace is Hongo from the right. The other three are Musashido, Nijisaki, and Kubota. Musashido was the man with the cash. Nijisaki was Hongo's right hand man. And Kubota developed the actual technical details of the experiments. Realization began to dawn in Junpei, along with a pressing question. How do you know all this? Come on, man, I told you, I finally got my memory back. Okay, yeah. No, that's get not that. what I mean. I'm trying to ask you why you knew all this stuff in the first place, before you forgot it. Seven rubbed the scar on his chin. You really want to know? Of course. Me too. Snake was the only one who didn't voice any sort of agreement. He looked at Junpei as if he was simply waiting to see where Seven's sudden recovery might take this them. This is going to take a while. Hell, it'll probably take me three days to tell you everything. You got eight hours! <laughs> We're not going three days! Well, we don't have three days. Strap in, it's time for a field trip. Oh, I'm ready. Just give us the short version, alright? Short version. The big man pulled off his hat and scratched his head. He made a face and put his hat back on. Fine. Give me a shot. No promises, though. Junpei and Clover nodded earnestly. I'm a detective. Oh, shit! All right! It's a little awkward to say this. Why do the detectives always lose their memories? I'm a lone wolf type. God damn it! I hold to my own code, as I think doing what's right is more important than doing what you're told. That's correct. That's why I followed my gut that night. A slim lead brought me to the wharf. It was nine years ago. The wharf had been cold as fuck, and I could barely see squat. I was investigating a mess of kidnappings, all of them children. It all had one thing in common. A history of visits to one particular hospital. A hospital under the management of Cradle Pharmaceuticals. Man, they really fucked up then. You, you, got, you gotta spread out a little bit. Oh, one hospital? Come on, guys. Of course you're gonna get figured out. My investigation had turned up evidence that Cradle had been involved in the kidnappings. This is just Umbrella. After a little sweet talking, I managed to finally get a real lead from someone inside Cradle. My source told me this. Tonight, a ship is set to take the children to a large passenger liner docked offshore. So I headed to the wall. In the shadows, I searched the harbor until I found the ship I was talking about. There was a bunch of movement. Men in black suits, many of them carrying large bags. Bags. There was something about the way they moved as they were carried. No doubt about it. There were human beings in those bags. I moved before I realized it. I came out of hiding with my gun already in my hand. Don't move. I felt metal touch the back of my head. Shit. Drop the gun. I could kill you right now. It'd be easy to get away with it, too. Just tie an anchor to your feet. No one would find you for a week. That what you want. The fish here would love a meal. I kept digging the cold metal thing into my skull. There was nothing I could do. I did what he said and laid my gun on the ground. Then suddenly, there was a sharp pain in my neck. A needle. A drug. That was my last thought. My face hit cold concrete. I was out with a light after that. <clears throat> I woke up on a hard floor. Damn it. Shit, my head hurts. I did a quick once over of the room. Where am I? 
A small, shabby bed, a dirty sink, a toilet with no privacy. I'd seen it countless times as a cop. I'm in a cell, huh? Facing the toilet was a door set into the wall. It was still pretty woozy, but I made my way over to it. I pushed and pulled on it, but... <clears throat> it won't open. Not like I expected much else. Would be dumb enough to put me in a cell and leave it unlocked. Threw myself against the door a few times, but it wouldn't budge. I knew it. I gave up and made my way back to the bed, and sat down. Hmm. Huh. I sat there for a very, very long time. <laughs> Who knows how long. Then, I heard a faint voice. The voice was far away. I couldn't understand what it was saying. But I could hear one. It was pretty high. Probably a little kid. Huh? No, it was several. Hmm. I hear five. Or six, maybe more. I'm pretty sure he's in one of the two locations that the games were played on. Just which Where one I don't know. From? The sound effect they used before when he's trying to open the door was the same sound effect that the boat makes. That could just be reusing it. I pressed my ear to the wall and tried to listen through it. No, that's not it. Left. It's coming from under the bed. I hauled on the little frame and flipped the thing over. There it was. The bed had hidden an air vent on it. The hole in the wall was covered by a metal grate. This face. I dropped flat on the floor and peered through the grate. I couldn't see shit, but I knew it in my gut. This was where those voices were coming from. Hold on. Why are there kids here? But then what my inside man told me popped into my head. Tonight, a ship is set to take the children to a large passenger liner docked offshore. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Am I on that ship? That would make sense. <clears throat> it didn't matter. All I knew was I had to get to those kids. I checked out the metal grate. <laughs> Could I fit? I stuck my fingers in and grabbed it. And then... <sighs> yeah! How do you like that, you son of a bitch? I finally got the damn thing off. Sweat was dripping down my face. I don't... So I wiped it off and crawled inside. I don't agree with you being able to fit into this hole, sir. The first bit or so was tight. I had a wriggle on my belly. It wind up eventually and there was space for me to crawl along on my hands and knees. I went from crawling like a worm in dirt to skittering like a bug. Couldn't say it was much better, but I'd take what I could get. Like, can you imagine here for a second? For whatever reason, you gotta crawl through a vent system. And you know, at first, it's, you know, make sure it's a tight fit, maybe. And you're starting to get your way through, and you're crawling in. But then at another point, your list starts to get tight again. And you try to, you're like, ah, screw, I could make my way through before, I can make my way through now. But then it gets tighter. And you're like, oh, I, oh shit, I can't move anymore. I can't go any for, for further. So you're thinking, I think, okay, I'm gonna back out and try to come at this from a different direction. And all of a sudden, you realize you can't get back out. You're stuck. What the fuck do you do? You just fucking die. Don't go into a ventilation system, people. This is, don't do this. And when I'd been in the thing long enough to start wondering where it'd take me. A massive sound nearly scared the piss out of me. It was like a heavy metal door had just been slammed shut. Then there was a voice. <laughs> Um... What? I wasn't sure what it meant, but anything with incinerator is bad news. Yep. Then, almost as if that was a cue, I heard a mess of young sounding voices. A bunch of them were straight up screaming in terror. And all the sounds together made a howl that made the hair on my neck stand straight up. Damn it! What the hell is going on here? I scrambled through the duct as fast as I could. I made a giant racket, but I didn't care at that point. 
I soon found a metal door on the left side of the duct. The kids were screaming on the other side. I found it. I yanked the handle and threw the door open. I almost ripped the metal off his hinges. Boy, he has great clarity of this event from this nine years place. ago. I couldn't believe what I saw. The room had a dome up top. There had to be about nine walls, all the same size. On the ceiling was an upside down funnel, almost like a chimney. I looked down. There they were. The kids I've been searching for. I don't remember who was in what facility. I remember, I know Santa and his sister in one, and I'm just thinking, you know, a white-haired guy. This kind of reminds me of Snake. And I'm just saying a ponytail, and for some reason that's bringing my June. They all got up at me, suddenly silent, for the moment, from surprise and fear. Scared of the room or me, I couldn't tell. Probably both, actually. <laughs> Not like I can blame them running into a mug like this when they're already scared shitless. I snorted at my own digging myself. Turn to the kids. Don't worry, kids. I'm not your enemy. I'm one of the good guys. All of them stood there, frozen. They have no proof of that. One. He was a boy, slightly older than me. Uh huh. Private school uniform. Who the hell are you? He stepped forward and glared at me suspiciously. I'm a detective. I'm here to rescue you. It looked like they relaxed some the second I got the words out. How are you gonna help us? Where's the exit? There isn't one. Doors we came in through won't open, and the door over there. He kind of cut himself off. I think he was considering something before he changed his mind. A very familiar looking door from our first ending. Anyway, there's no point. We can't all get out of here. If we don't get out of here, we're gonna be burned to death. Burned to death? Can't you hear it? That voice said the incinerator's gonna start up soon. So. So. <laughs> voice spoke again. Incineration will begin in 15 minutes. They only had 15 minutes. I looked back down at the kids. Looks like a good 20 or 30 feet to the floor. No way I could pull them up. Too big of a distance for any of us to reach. What the hell was I gonna do? I mean, stand on shoulders, maybe? But then I got an idea. Wait right there. I'm gonna be right back. What? Wh where is he going? Are, are you just gonna leave us here? They just got frightened again. I'm not the best at that kind of thing, but I tried to reassure them with a smile. <laughs> Don't worry, all right? I'll be back, I promise. So just stay calm and wait right there. Got it? I didn't wait to hear them respond. It wasn't time. I had to hurry. Well, as fast as a guy could on his hands and knees. Didn't take me long to get back to my cell. Still no way out of it, but I had a plan. I needed something from the room. When I got it, I dove back into the hole and took off towards the incinerator. Bed sheet? Then, sorry to keep you waiting, guys. I tipped out the doorway and dropped down the rope I brought with me. Back in the cell, I yeah. torn the bed sheets into strips and tied them together to make a rope. It was sloppy, but it got the job done. All right, just tie that around yourself, okay? I'll pull you up one at a time. Right. Huh. Wait a sec. Something is off. There were more of you before. Where'd the rest of you go? The boy in the uniform answered. I mean, I still only see four people. I let them go on ahead. We opened the number nine door and they left. What? You're telling me you opened that door? That's what I said. Then what the hell are you doing here? We couldn't go with them. Why not? Look, the only people who can go through the number door. He was in the middle of explaining. When... Incineration will begin in five minutes. Yeah, maybe save the explanation for after the rescue? The wall shook a bit, and the voice bouncing around. Look, that can wait, all right? Just get us out of here! Uh, right! I grabbed onto the rope. First one I pulled up was a girl with a ponytail. Next was a girl with a red necktie. A boy in a jacket came after her. He said he'd climb up on his own. He was wearing the uniform at the last stop. Like the other kid, he climbed up the rope himself. He looked pretty scrawny, but I guess he was stronger than he looked. He moved fast, but when he was almost to me... I had a feeling from this picture he was going to fall. I heard some knocking. Everyone looked at the door. It had a thick, square window set into it. On the other side, an angry face was staring in. God damn it! What's going on here? Why is the room empty? Where the hell are those fucking kids? Away from you, you fucking asshole. The 
door open, and a man stepped in looking half mad with fury. I recognized his face. I saw him many times in photos during my investigation. The man's name was Gintaru Hongo, the CEO of Cradle Pharmaceuticals. Hongo saw the boy hanging from the rope. Yeah! It was like he was an animal. He lunged for the rope. Hurry! I know! The boy in the uniform booked it up the rope. You son of a bitch! Get back here, you little shit! No, it doesn't matter. You won't be able to recognize their faces. 15 feet. 10. The second I could reach the kid, I grabbed him. I hauled him up and tossed him into the duck behind me. No! No! Hongo had lost it. His face didn't even look human. It was like the bastard pulled off his fake face. He was really a terrifying devil or some kind of damn monster. I quickly reeled in the rope, leaving a furious Hongo yelling at me from the floor. You fucking bastard! You won't get away with this! How dare you compromise this experiment! Maybe you should have fucking had him killed and not just locked him in a goddamn cell in the same place your experiment's being run. You fucking dumbass! Literally, this is on you. Experiment? What experiment? Incineration will begin one minute. Hey! Old man! What the hell are you doing? Hurry up! The boy in the uniform was trying to get my attention. I may have thrown a salute in a raging asshole's face before I closed the door behind me. No point to going back to the cell, so we went down the other direction instead. After about 30 feet, we came across another duct on the left. This one was heading down. When he nodded, and took turns sliding down it. The duct emptied us out into a narrow hallway. There was a door on either side. The one on the left was a normal double door. But the one on the right was familiar. It had black and yellow stripes. A device next to it on the wall. The plate on it read, Incinerator. Incinerator? Yeah, that's where we were. It was the girl with the red tie who answered me. We were inside an incinerator? Yeah. Bongo might still be there. It looks like it's been shut off, though. Damn. Wait, what? If he's still in there... Yeah. That's not good. <sighs> that meant we better. We gotta get out of here. Go to the other door. Hurry! The kids started running, and I was close on their heels. On the other side of the door was a large spiral staircase. Run! Didn't need to tell them twice. We went up and up and up. Feet pounding the steps, our arms pumping fast. We went round, round, round. The devil was in the tail. <sighs> the stairway kept going. We passed a couple of landings when the boy in the uniform suddenly spoke. <laughs> Something's up. Akane's not catching up to us. Akane? All right, I forgot that they said that was the name of his sister. My kid's sister. The girl with the red necktie. Akane. I thought the pairs were supposed to be split up. Which were different locations. I didn't remember seeing that name on the list of missing kids. Hey! Akane! He kept his hands around his mouth and yelled. <laughs> Maybe we outran her. We're in the uniforms getting to a stop. We stopped too. So did the other two kids. When did we do that? Well, we passed a couple big rooms on the way here. Maybe she took a rest in one of them? No, that's impossible. Sorry, Grandpa. You keep going. I gotta go look for her downstairs. He turned to go. Hey, kid, wait! God damn it, I said wait! I don't think the kid even heard me. Fuck. I spun around to the boy in the jacket, the girl with the ponytail. I'm going after him. You two keep going, all right? You got it? The girl nodded and ran up the stairs. The boy. I'm going with you. <sighs> <laughs> that is definitely a young snake voice. I didn't have time to argue. I just nodded and took off down the stairs. I could hear him following me. We ran all the way to the bottom floor, calling for her. Akane was nowhere to be found. God damn it, where the hell did she go? I could tell the kid was frustrated. And then suddenly... Help me! Somebody help me! We heard a girl's voice. Akane! in the uniform threw open the door and leapt into the hallway by the incinerator. We rushed in after him. I couldn't for the life of me believe what we were seeing. Are you telling me she went back in the in fucking incinerator? That bastard Hongo had Kane by the arm and was forcing her into the incinerator. Come on, goddammit, move! No, I don't want to! Let me go, please! Let go of me! She 
planted her feet squarely on the floor and was struggling to get away. But Hongro was bigger and stronger. She wasn't gonna win. Uh, Akane! Her brother roared with anger and charged toward Hongro. Help me! Ah, you're too late, idiot! Hongo lifted Akane bodily into the air and threw her, still fighting him in the incinerator. Before we could even blink, Hongo had leapt through the door after her. Notice they changed her name to say Connie, now just as Kane. Even though I don't think he called her that. Everything we could think of to get the thing open. But. Wait, he's in there too? Ah, fuck! It's no use! Goddamn thing won't move an inch! <laughs> he started slamming his fists against the door. He was close to shattering his knuckles with how hard he pounded on it. Akane! Akane! Are you okay? You came back! Her voice was muffled, but all of us could hear the sheer terror in it. What did I do? I, I think I'm trapped in here. Kill Ace. Where's Hongo? He went out the other door. W what? Warning. Warning. Emergency incineration command has been acknowledged. All matter incineration will take place in 18 minutes. Oh, so it's restarted. Okay. Why is it starting at 18 minutes? Seems odd. Are you fucking kidding me? It's the same damn thing. Are you there? Yeah, we're here. Just hang on, all right? We're gonna figure out a way to save you. His words would have seemed like a sick joke to her if she'd been able to see how white and bloodless his face was right then. Incineration will begin in 17 minutes. <laughs> something out I promise I promise okay you hear me I promise it was torture listening to her sobbing on the other side of the door her brother was nearly crying himself he could only stand there fists clenched so tight his knuckles were white <sighs> well at least now we know what seven's involvement was for the previous games uh, it's still technically unclear if the June and Akane we know it's the same as that Akane, but that one supposedly died, yet this one's a lie. I don't, I don't know what that's all about. We still don't know what the fuck Lotus has to do with anything, or why the fuck we're here. But it was silent. All they can hear was the creaking of the boat as it shifted in the water. They waited, and waited. But Seven didn't continue. Uh, what happened then? Junpei couldn't wait any longer. He had to know. Seven looked at Come the floor. Come on, man. Put yourself in my shoes. It doesn't end good. You think I want to remember that? Then... Yeah. Shit. If I'd known it was going to be like this, I almost wish I hadn't remembered. Seven shook his head. But there was something Junpei had hey, to know. Um, are you... are you sure? Huh? Look, I don't want to ask this either, but there's there's something I don't get. <clears throat> so if you could just tell me, did that girl, Akane, really... Seven stares straight ahead at nothing. Yeah, I'm sure. There wasn't anything we could do. After a while, the countdown ended, and we heard something burning. We... But did you hear a scream? The fire stopped, but we still didn't move. Me and the jacket kid were frozen. The boy in the uniform collapsed as if he couldn't hold himself up anymore. A few minutes passed. The door opened. The boy
boy in the uniform tripped over his own feet running in. We followed, too numb to speak. The air in the incinerator was hot. Every breath made my lungs feel like they were on fire. It was like standing on hot asphalt. The air was wavering and... And in the middle of the room... There it lay. The kid's legs were shaking so bad, I don't know how he managed to walk. I couldn't see his face, but... His body somehow looked empty. Finally, he reached it. He fell to his knees as his legs gave out on him. And then... Junpei felt a cold lump form in the pit of his stomach. A feeling of sickening anticipation washed over him. He could feel his body shivering. He desperately did not want to know the answer he feared he knew already, but he had to ask. He had to know for sure. Um, uh, can I ask you one more thing? What's that? The girl, Akane. What was her last name? What does it matter to you? Just, just tell me, okay? Please? Seven looked at Junpei curiously and ran his tongue quickly over his dry lips. Kurashiki. Her name was Akane Kurashiki. <laughs> okay. I had a thought, just real quick here. Early on, early on, June was a little bit like in the in the early part of the game when we after we did our first ending, we chose the opposite door from the beginning. We got to actually do a escape room with June, and she was being a uh, clingy as fuck. She mentioned that a classmate could have been involved with all this. Well, her brother would have been, you know, somebody at their school, and our character went to school with the, with June. So, uh, looks like she might have been right all along. Maybe she knew everything that was going on from the beginning. Something inside of Junpei stopped. Oh, and she might be a ghost. Maybe we're imagining all this. I don't... I don't know how she's here. This is the part that confuses me the most. I just... I... He had no more words left. He had no more Junpei left. It was the shell of flesh and bone. Seven turned to Snake. You were there that day, weren't you? The tall kid in the jacket. That was you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You are correct, Detective. Junpei's mind was blank, withdrawn from the world. Somewhere far away, he could hear Seven and Snake talking. Don't misunderstand me. I told you before how Zero threatened me. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't say anything about what happened nine years ago. So you're saying you're not working for Zero, right? Of course not. Clover. What about you? Hey, come on! You really think I'm working with Zero? That's not a no! I told you before, you idiot! I was in Nevada, in Building Q. That's also not a no! I did hear that a detective rescued the kids on the boat, but... This is a lot of words that aren't no. I didn't know it was you! Her surprise seemed to be genuine. Seven regarded Clover for a moment, and rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Well, I guess I believe you. Actually, you know what? No, we do. We do know that can't be here. She died in the timeline that where Zero was still. Oh no, she could. Technically... No, that's right. He wasn't saying she is. It's just that she's probably working with him. Which again, she's not saying All no. Right, let me ask you another question. He stuck his hands into his pockets and took a few steps. Then he stopped and turned to face them Sanchez's again. His real name is Aoi Kurashiki. Uh huh. He's Akane's brother. Mm -hmm. You know that? No, I didn't. Did you? Well, yes. I know Aoi Kurashiki was her brother. But I didn't know he was Santa. At least not from the beginning. Nine years ago, he was in the middle of puberty. His voice is entirely different now. As is yours. I'm ashamed to say that even my exceptional hearing wasn't able to make that connection. As such, I had no reason to think Santa was Aoi. When did you figure it out? 
Clover told me that Santa might have been one of the subjects of the initial experiment. It was only a short while ago, while we were leaving the library. When she told me that, I had a feeling. Santa is Aoi, Akane Kurashiki, June's brother? That spark caught flame in Junpei's leaden mind, and the fog began to clear. Like an engine beginning to turn, images and thoughts began to coalesce in his mind, coming faster and faster, forming bigger images, bigger thoughts. Junpei blinked. He was back. There's still a lot we don't know. I mean, like, a lot, a lot. But there is one thing I think we can say we know. What's that? Ace is an asshole. That's what we know. The body we found in the shower room. It had to be Nijisaki, dressed up to look like Snake. Hmm. What? Come on, man. What kind of detective are you? You didn't figure that out already? Hey, go easy on me, man. I just got my memory back, all right? Cut me some slack. Okay, but the last detective I know that lost memory was still very good at detectiving before they got the memory back. Hmm. Well, if he is, the three murders make sense then, don't they? Yeah, that's right. Murder. Kubota blew himself up, but that was murder too. So why did these murders take place? If Junpei is correct, and the body in the shower room was Nijisaki's, that means all of the people who were murdered were involved with the creation of the Nonary Project. Kubota, the person who conducted the actual experiments. Nijisaki, Hongo's assistant. Musashido, the man who financed the project. You mean this was all just revenge? Santa is zero. He's getting revenge for the death of his sister. That's why he killed them. No, yeah. I, I don't think Santa actually murdered anyone. In fact, Jinpei didn't think he knew. I mean, he's right with two of them, but what about the captain? He couldn't explain why or how, but he had noted that Santa had killed no one. Perhaps the madness of the last several hours was finally driving him insane, but Junpei had ceased to be surprised at his sudden knowledge and had even begun to if accept right, it. Then it's not hard to figure out who the next victim's gonna be, is it? I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you. Yes. Yep. Right. Snake, Clover, and Seven all nodded. The next target will be Gintaro Hongo. The person who planned the Nonary Project. In other words, Ace. Good. Fuck him. There was a moment of silence. What? And then the room shook. From far away, they heard the sudden rush of water. Wh what the hell's going on here? It must be 6 a.m. Our time is up. Oh. Shit. Come on. Right. We need to get out of here. How? In the drawer that had held the picture was a key card. Junpei grabbed it. I'm betting this sucker opens the exit. Come on, let's go. <laughs> New material? Key card zero. Is it a zero or is it an O? Oh. Zero, zero. God damn it. Zero's just screwing with us, isn't he? Uh, I'm trying to remember a word of effect. Yeah. All right, let's just swip the card. Junpei, look! It's unlocked! Yeah! Now we can go back to the library! Hurry up, Junpei. We don't have time. Let's go! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what the fuck have you guys been saying for this last bit? Uh, Lotus gets some preliminary info in door two. She has two twin daughters who participate in the game. Oh, okay. All right, so I guess we'll find that out eventually as we go down through other doors. Uh, all these people pronounce the Aoi different. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That's why in Nigger Up we just say Hina and not the first name because I don't know how an A, O, and I is supposed to be pronounced together. What? Uh, a zero credit card. It has zero credit. You can pay for nothing. Well, you never go into debt either. Fair enough. All right. <sighs> the door opened and they stumbled into the library. Huh. This I fucking room. shaking stopped. It would seem so, but we are yet to be out of danger. You're right. Let's hurry. They ran across the hallway. 
This exit needs the Uranus card too. Straight for the large metal door. Next to the door was the Uranus card reader. Hey, Junpei. Yeah, I know. They slid the key card through and the door rumbled open. Alright, it's open. Let's go. Out of library and into the hallway they ran. At the end of the hallway was a door. Junpei reached into his pocket to pull out the keys as he ran toward it. Okay, Neptune Key. Let's see if you work. Imagine if it didn't. Yes! Oh, I think it unlocked. You think? The lock clicked as when they shoved the door open and poured through it. Oh. Also, I recently learned about Makoto Naegi. On the back of his hoodie, it's a logo of a gas mask. That part I knew. Uh, a possibly a cheeky Zero Escape reference from Spike Chunsoft. I, I remember reading about the hoodie that there was a, the that there were the gas masks on it, but I did not remember what it was referencing because I had not looked at this stuff yet. So I I, I knew I just forgot. There there was there's a lot of character designs that they put into a lot of things for for a lot of references in those games I found. Ah, but in front of them was another great metal door. Above it was a metal plaque. It says. Uh, incinerator. That one. So this is the incinerator. Let's not go in there. The first time I've seen it from this side, but yeah. Then there ought to be a lever near the door. Yeah, right here. Jude pay right up to it. Pull that and the door should open. Got it. As he spoke, he pulled the lever. The motor on the door groaned as it slowly ground open. There was no time to waste. As soon as the door had opened far enough to admit them all, all uh, to admit them, all four dashed through. Then suddenly, there before them were the four who they'd parted from earlier. Ace and Lotus stood in front of the number nine door. Santa was curled into a ball against the wall of the incinerator, holding a stomach. And then there was June. She sat slumped against the wall, exhausted. What the hell is going on? Junpei ran toward Ju. He skidded to a stop in front of her and knelt What's down. Wrong? Are you okay? Her face was pale and her lips dry because she's a fucking ghost. When she spoke, he could barely hear her. You came to get me. Of course I did. I made a promise. I'm so glad you're here. So glad. She mumbled the same words over and over, weekly. Junpei could feel his heart breaking. What happened to you? I'm fine. I just fainted. I wasn't feeling very good. I'm feeling a lot better now, though. Are you sure? Yes. I just need to rest a little longer. I'm, I'm sure I'll be fine. You shouldn't worry about me. Man, I'm worried if you exist. She was looking towards Santa. Junpei turned to look as well. Santa. Santa grimaced, his face contorted in pain. Seven grabbed him by the collar and roared at him. Where is it? Where's the gun? You hide it somewhere? Despite himself, a grunt of pain escaped Santa's lips as Seven shook I him. Don't have it. I got sucker punched and they took the gun. What? Who took it? What? Isn't that obvious? I took the gun. Ah. Ace. We're back to this sprite. Cool. Crazy eyes! He did indeed have the revolver in his hand. Here we go again. It was pressed against Lotus's temple. <laughs> Fucking fantastic. Ace had her pinned to him with the other arm, and she was shaking visibly. Her fiery attitude was gone, replaced by fear. She didn't dare speak. There was sweat on her forehead. When her eyes weren't flickering up to the gun pressed against her, they seemed to desperately want to say Just something. what the hell do you think you're doing, Ace? Or maybe I ought to say Gintaru Hongo, CEO of Cradle Pharmaceuticals. Seven's deep baritone rumble through the walls. And Ace sneered. You have me at a disadvantage. And I don't like that. You know me, but I don't know you. Do you have any idea how much I've suffered? Can you even begin to understand my pain? Mm, don't really care, to be honest. I just kind of want you to die. The pain of prosopagnosia, right? 
Junpei's voice was casual. Or at least it was trying to be. Another irritating insect. And how do you know that? Hmm? Good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Junpei couldn't say. He just knew. Another unexplainable mystery. No matter. If you don't want to answer, it makes no difference to me. This is a waste of time anyway. It's time for me to go. Behind Ace, Junpei could see the red. It was placed in the small indentation on the wall. Quickly, Ace placed his hand on the scanner. First is one. Give me your hand. Uh. It beeped, and he forced Alyssa's hand onto it as well. Eight. And with this... Then at last, he reached into the pocket of his jacket. He pulled something out and pressed it against the panel. There's number nine. The third asterisk appeared on the red. The thing he had used for the final verification was the bracelet with the number nine. The ninth man. Kubota's bracelet. One, eight, nine, eighteen, nine. I believe I've won this game. His smirk made Junpei's blood boil. I've had quite a time playing with you. I must thank Zero, I suppose. Wait, what? Ace doesn't know who Zero is. Junpei's eyes flickered towards Santa. Uh, uh. He hadn't moved since they'd entered the room. Santa was still holding his stomach and groaning as if in immense pain. Junpei wasn't sure if it was real pain, but he wasn't sure it wasn't either. What the hell are you planning, Santa? At any rate, this game ends now. I will escape, and the rest of you will have a slightly less pleasant ending. I suggest you enjoy your final moments. Goodbye. Wait! Ace, of course, paid no heed to Seven's request and laid hold of the lever on the red. With a sickening sense of finality, he pulled it. What? Why isn't it opening? <sighs> One more time. Lotus tried to take advantage of Ace's confusion and managed to twist herself out of his grasp. But, at the last second, he grabbed hold of her wrist and shoved it onto the red. Now open! He waved the number nine person over the red, and then his own person as well. He pulled the lever a second time. No! What is this? Why? That digital root should be nine! It has to be nine! Then why? Why isn't it opening? All right, I remember now. Cause that's not nine. It's six. Ace's fury and confusion had overridden all other thoughts. He had set down the revolver. It was just below the no. red. Seven chose that moment to act. He moved far faster than a man of his bulk should have been able to, and he launched that bulk straight at Ace. <laughs> It was over before they knew it. In the blink of an eye, Ace was on the floor. He rolled onto his side, groaning in pain. Ugh. Lotus ran straight for Junpei. She darted around behind him and stuck her head out, making sure to keep Junpei between herself and Ace. Oh, that was close. Too close. Thank you, Seven. Don't mention it. Seven stood over Ace, his breathing slow and heavy. Just one punch ain't enough for this piece of shit. After what he did nine years ago, I ought to rip him to pieces. But if a suspect can't talk, they ain't much good. Once he's locked up in a cell, we're gonna have a little chat. Nine years ago? Uh, then you must be... Yeah, you finally figured it out, dumbass. Oh. Ace planted his hands on the floor and shook his head. <sighs> Junpei walked toward him. He stopped and looked down at Ace with pity on his Ace, face. you killed Kubota, Nijisaki, and Musashido, didn't you? Wait, Nijisaki? He peered at Junpei, genuinely confused. Oh, right. You don't know yet. All right, we'll just go through them in order then. Let's start off with Kubota. You talked to Kubota and managed to convince him to go into door five alone. You killed him without making it look like you killed him. The way I figure it, 
You had four motives. One. In the Nonary game, the number nine is dangerous. Whoever had the nine bracelet could join whatever team they wanted. Adding nine to any number doesn't change the digital route. Yes, it's yes. Which means that number nine could do whatever they wanted. You wanted to remove that threat as soon as possible. Two. You wanted the number nine bracelet for yourself, so that you could make use of its power. In fact, you did use it in the murder of Niji Saki. Three. Even if his number hadn't been nine, Kubota was a problem. He knew your past. He knew what had happened nine years before. You needed to silence him before he told anyone. Four. But last, and perhaps the most disturbing. You're a complete psychopath. You used Kubota as a test. You wanted to know how serious this nonary game was. Was it truly life or death or simply a harmless prank? You convinced him to break the rules so you could see what would happen. That was why you killed Kubota. But he was only the first. Next was Nijisaki. While everyone was off looking for the missing parts for the Reds, you ran into Nijisaki near the big hospital room. However, because of your prosopagnosia, you didn't realize he was Nijisaki. Stupid chair. Chiefly because, when you met him, he was dressed like Snake. That was why you thought Nijisaki was Snake. No, that, that's not... That was Nijisaki? Why? How did... I'll get to that. Anyway, you thought he was Snake. Snake was one of the kids in your experiment nine years ago. You remembered him because he was the blind kid. But his presence made you think. Snake was one of my subjects nine years ago. He probably hates me. But if that's true, why isn't he saying anything? Is he keeping quiet because he can't see? Or perhaps he's working with Zero to get revenge on me. Whatever the reason, anyone who knows my past is a threat. Before he tries anything, I need to get rid of him. That was when you decided you had to kill him. The murder weapon was Kubota's bracelet. You just waved it over the red. Verified your own number and then grabbed Nijisaki's arm and forced it over the scanner panel. Then, when the door opened, you kicked him in. Nine seconds later, the door closed. And then 81 seconds passed. And poor Nijisaki was dead. I don't know if I call him poor Nijisaki. He is a dick, too. Then you mean to say Snake is still alive? Sorry to disappoint you, but I'm as good as new. <laughs> Thank you for killing the wrong man, but I can't say I like knowing that you wanted me dead. Although, to be honest, even if you hadn't tried to kill me, I would still hate you very much. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't blame you. Ace's self-derision was furiating and frustrating, but Junpei kept his emotions in check and continued. Last but not least, let's talk about Musashido's death. When Clover and I were investigating the chart room, you came over to talk to me. Do you remember what you said? Oh, a pocket watch. Might I take a look at it? I handed it to you, and you left the room. You had been in charge of the Nonary Project. Of course you would have known the solution to every puzzle. Which would mean that you also knew how to get out of the wheelhouse. All you had to do was place the watch in the indentation on the door to unlock it. With the door open, you could enter the captain's quarters. Musashido was there. Conveniently placed next to him was an axe that practically begged you to kill him with it. You picked up that axe and buried the blade deep in the other man's chest. One blow was all it took. I'm not too sure why, though. And then you returned to the chart room as if nothing had happened. Like, what, what, what was the point in killing him, and why was he just sitting there waiting to be killed? There was something I wanted to speak with you about, Junpei. Could you come with me for a moment? I had no reason to say no, so I followed you to the wheelhouse. When we stepped inside, remember how you slipped your hand into my vest? You pulled out a piece of paper, the one I used to cheat during the vote. But that wasn't really what you were after. Your true purpose had been to slip the watch into my pocket. It wasn't a very good plan. Had way too many holes, and someone saying the wrong thing could have brought it all down around you. You must have been desperate. But what made you willing to risk it all to do it? Ace. 
That was the only thing Junpei hadn't been able to figure Musashido's out. Musashido's murder is the only one I don't understand. You obviously did it, but why? Fun fact, if you had checked your inventory back then after Ace talked to you, the watch appears in your item screen. Damn it. Because of this. Slowly, Ace reached down and pulled something out of his pocket. It was a folded What's piece of paper. paper. Just read it. <sighs> Junpei took it. I had opened it. This is what it said. Number one. There are two ways you might survive this ordeal. The first is to win the nonary game. The second is for you to confess your sins of nine years past. I have prepared a camera in the captain's quarters. The images captured by that camera will be streamed through a satellite and distributed across the world. Simply look into the camera and repent. Once you have confessed everything, I will release you from this ship. To make your confession more credible, I have left you a witness in the captain's quarters. Perhaps he will confess with you. The decision is yours. Do as you please. Zero. Hmm. When I awoke in that room on D-Deck, I found that in my pocket. Hmm. That was why I chose door one when we voted. If I went through that door, I knew I could get to the captain's quarters. As you said, I knew how to enter the wheelhouse. My plan was to find the pocket watch before anyone else. If I could, then my alibi would be set. At least, that was the plan. Unfortunately for me, you got to it first. That sleight of hand was the best I could manage on short notice. You meant to kill him from the beginning then? Uh, Musashido, I mean. I only knew Musashido was the witness after I reached the captain's quarters. I asked him, and he answered. He seemed groggy. Perhaps he had only just awoken from sedation. I suppose Nijisaki was in much the same state. He seemed confused and disoriented when I encountered him. But yes, you are correct. I intended to kill him from the beginning, even though I didn't know who he was. I also wonder why Ace and Nine were part of the game, but the other two were just NPCs involved with it. Why not make all of them involved? Or just him, make the Nine also be a, an NPC to get, mur to get murdered later. I proceeded to the captain's quarters in order to remove this so-called witness. Ace had confessed to everything. What energy he had left with the what energy he had left him with the truth, and he sagged on his knees. Although he had confessed, his sins were not forgiven. <sighs> Junpei felt revulsion for the pathetic man on the floor near his feet. But in among the revulsion was a hint of pity. After all, Ace had not been the only person who murdered those three men. Junpei spoke quietly. Ace, you, you figured it out, haven't you? You were being manipulated. Yes, so it would seem. I was little more than a puppet, in many ways. Everywhere I went, everything was already prepared. The reds in the large hospital room were dismantled. Nijisaki was dressed like snake. There was an axe in the captain's quarters. Musashido was delirious from the anesthetic, so he couldn't fight back. <sighs> Nijisaki as well. In retrospect, I can't understand how I could have fallen into such a simple trap. But yes, yes, this was a trap. It was Zero's trap. And I fell for it, hook, line, and sink. I did everything he wanted me to do. You sure did. Yeah. By manipulating you, Zero was able to kill three people and keep the blood off his own hands. All of this was revenge for what happened nine years ago. That's why this nonary game happened. Am I right, Santa? Junpei looked over at Santa. As Junpei spoke, he stood up, his legs still shaky. Huh? What the hell are you talking about? I don't know any... Ain't no point trying to play dumb anymore, Santa. Actually, I guess I should call you Aoi Kurashiki, huh? Seven's face was sad as he spoke. My memory came back to me, kid. You're Aoi Kurashiki, no doubt about it. Never thought I'd be back in this room talking to you. But hey, I guess this was all part of your plan, right? After all, the person who planned the nonary game this time around was Zero. And Zero's you. <laughs> Looks like you really do have your memories back, huh? Santa's smile was sarcastic and uh, something else. Well, I guess there's no point in hiding it then, huh? Yeah, you got me. 
I'm Aoi Kurishiki. I was one of the kids in the Nonary game nine years ago. I made it out. So did Snake over there. But there's one thing... No, I, I guess there's two things you got wrong. Number one, I ain't zero. Okay. What? Wait, what? Sure, I was helping Zero out, but I'm really more of an assistant, like a secretary. But an assistant's only an assistant. I didn't come up with all this. All I did was follow Zero's orders. Then, if you're not Zero, who is? Camera pan to June. Calm down there, Junpei. <laughs> didn't I say two things? You made one more mistake, Junpei. You just said, all of this was revenge for what happened nine years ago. That's why this nonary game happened. But that's not it. Revenge isn't the only purpose. Yeah, but it's the purpose. There's another reason you guys were playing the nonary game. <sighs> to save someone. Save someone? Right. You were brought here to help my sister. To save Akane. What the hell are you talking about? Akane Kurashiki died nine years ago in this room. I was there. I saw... Uh. Suddenly, Seven froze. His eyes went as wide as dinner plates when he spun around toward June. June Pei followed his gaze. What? She was gone. Where June had been, there was nothing. What the hell? Where's. Where is she? Where's Akane Kurashiki? Seven began to mumble to himself. A strange series of words strung together as if his mind wasn't functioning properly. His face was twisted with effort, as though he were struggling with something they couldn't see. He gritted his teeth and pressed his hands against the sides of his head. Oh, my head! Oh, my head, it feels like it's gonna pop! Seven! What the hell is going on? I don't know. I don't know, I just... Oh, I swear to God, my head feels like it's about to explode! You know, for the sake of everyone in this room and their clothing. I'm really hoping your head doesn't explode. From somewhere far away, they all heard a deep, heavy noise. It sounded like a tremendous wheel slowly beginning to turn. Santa seemed to have entered an almost trance-like state. His words were calm and measured. What was the Nonary Project? I'm sure you know already, but I'll tell you one more time. It was a project designed to test a particular phenomenon. And what was that phenomenon? For two organisms to communicate with one another in the absence of physical contact. The morphogenetic field theory. Could human beings use these invisible fields to exchange information? Are we saying that June became trapped in the field? That was what this experiment was conducted to determine. <sighs> there were two separate locations. One was the gigantic and the other was a building in Nevada called Building Q. The nine children trapped in Building Q were faced with numerous puzzles, copies of identical ones in the gigantic. They were told to send their answers into the morphic field set and transmit them to their brothers and sisters on the gigantic. Okay, but we had a pair of brother and sister on the gigantic, which doesn't make any sense. <sighs> the transmitters were put in Building Q and the receivers were put on the gigantic. Each sibling pair was supposed to be split up, but but, but they fucked there up. Was a mistake. Akane was a transmitter. She should have been in Building Q. However, for some reason, she was placed in the gigantic with the receivers, like me. Perhaps she was mistaken for someone who was supposed to be in Group A. Whatever the case, Akane ended up on the gigantic. <sighs> I think I've told you enough. You get it, don't you? I'm pretty sure you know where this is going, Junpei. Where what is going? Don't play dumb. You know things you shouldn't. Things you couldn't. How did you know Ace had prosopagnosia? How did you know why Ace wanted to kill Kubota and how Nijisaki was killed? Were you surprised when you found out Ace was Hongo? And what about the coffin Snake was trapped in? How the hell did you open it? Well, that's... The answer to that is easy! He knew because I knew. Junpei was receiving information that I sent to him through the morphic field set. It's simple, really. How do I know the alternate futures, then? Imagine a river that's split in two, like an upside-down Y. The river flows from the top to the bottom, from a single stream to the two branches. It only flows in one direction. It can never flow backward. 
Information is the same way. It moves from the past to the future, but it never flows backward. That's why people at the river's source, in the past, will never know about these about those downstream in the future. But the people downstream will never know about one another either. Information only flows along the path of the river. But I am different. I can manipulate the morphic field set to pluck knowledge from the future. I know what happens on either fork of the river, even though the people on either fork know nothing about one another. Now, who am I? I am I, the ninth letter of the alphabet. But I am also zero. No, that's not true. I'm not really zero. Not yet. Perhaps you could say I am less than zero. Zero is my future. In nine years, I will be zero. Why are we stuck on the adventure screen again? Why does it keep doing that? It bothers me and I can't click it to change it back yet. Where, where did she go? June? No, Akane. Where did you go? Santa! Why is Clover? Oh shit. Freeze. Why would anybody want to stop this from happening? I am on board with the murder of Ace. Santa's got the gun. Guess he picked it up when we weren't watching. Looks like he's turned the tables on Ace, though. Wonder how he looks having a gun to his head. Get up. Sure isn't about to take that gun off him for a minute, is he? Ace isn't putting up any kind of fight. I mean, I don't think I would either. But he just looks... drained. Uh, I guess he's going for the door, huh? He doesn't need to verify to go through the door, but... Hey, what's your plan, Santa? What are you doing? He can't get through any number of doors with just two people. What the hell is he thinking? Didn't I tell you? I'm Santa Claus. It's time for me to go make a wish come true. That's it? That's all he's gonna give us? What the hell does that even mean? Shit. They're out. All right, and I think that's going to be a good stopping point here for today's episode. Uh, according to these after facts, so I don't really know strictly what I just did, but I hope you enjoyed what we just saw, and tune in for the next episode of Nine Hours, Nine Birds, Nine Doors. See you all next time. Bye, everyone.